Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jesus Rodriguez, and welcome to Chavista Chronicles from Caracas for Orinoco Tribune. Today, we have the pleasure to interview. We're going to have like a, 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 I don't know how to say it, like two way interchange. Like, like interchange interview with uh, one of the most active uh, anti imperialist and anti war uh, activists in Chicago. His name is Stan Smith, and he is the one behind the website at Chicago Alba Solidarity. So uh, what we're going to do is that we're going to talk today about coronavirus in, uh, in the U.S. and maybe in Venezuela, and I will ask Stan four questions, and then he, he will make some questions to me. So the first question for you, Stan, is how do you understand social, I mean, how do you see U.S. citizens understand social distancing in the U.S.? Ah, uh, well, yeah, thanks for having me here. Uh, social distancing here is a voluntary thing. Some people obey it, some people don't. The same thing in Venezuela, you know that, right? No, I don't know about that. Yes, yes but, but some people in other countries, um, they have curfews and things like that, but... Right. Oh, and Venezuela does not. Mm -mm. Oh. But I think the major problem the U.S. faces is that the government faces, both Republicans and Democrats, is they don't want to do something that gives the impression to the American people that a national health care or health care program and a national public health program is a good idea for people. And so if you don't want to do anything that is uh, require some public health care measures, then the only thing the government can really do is just say, stay home and stay away from people. And it just like, it's not our responsibility to take care of your health. You just like, stay home until this goes away and then, okay. But don't ask us to do anything for you. That's basically the attitude of the government. Now, it's a lot of Americans say, well, yeah, their attitude is that, well, the government's not really doing anything to solve this problem, so the only thing we can do is stay home. Other than that, we're, uh, we're just up to our own resources to take care of ourselves because the government's not doing anything. Uh, example is like, even today, this is like the national emergency was made March 13th by Trump. And right now, I just saw in the Wall Street Journal that today they're discussing that maybe next week they'll be taking people's temperatures in the airport before they get on planes in 12 airports, but they haven't decided what 12. And so they, after. And they, are still they still are discussing about the use of face masks. Yeah, why. yeah. Yeah, but it's even it's like two months after this, they're not checking anybody in an airport. It's kind of amazing. And I can also, I know a guy who's a friend of mine who's a nurse in a hospital. And he said, told me a couple of days ago that they have never checked him for coronavirus since he's been working there. And he's a nurse in a hospital. I know right now, I, I checked it up, that there's 3% of the population have been tested for coronavirus after two months of this national emergency. I mean, it's just uh, the government is really not doing anything. And people know that the government is not doing anything. The only thing people... Sorry, Stan. And do you know if that people, I mean, those massive testing that Trump has been announcing lately uh, are paid? People have to use their 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 their, their Medicaid or, or their insurance or how it works. Do you know how it is? No, I don't know. Okay, okay. I I just have that doubt. I don't know exactly how it works in the U.S., but as I know the U.S. society. I can assume that that's what I repeat, right? I would assume so, yeah. I haven't tried to get tested because I just figure, well, I could get tested and be not have it today, and then I could get it tomorrow walking down the street. So 
go in the grocery store. Now, now, now you go into a store, you have to wear a mask in Chicago. Wow. We did that since the very beginning in Venezuela. Uh, they just started that maybe a week ago. Wow. So you can see the government is not, not doing anything, really. Just the most minimal, minimal things. I mean, that's like, what, 2,000 people die a day now. Yes, that's great. Now it's, it's over 90,000. And they're still like... And you know, there's... To me, before going uh, live, going uh, to the recording of the interview about the protest that you visited today, can you talk to me about it? Oh, for the reopen Illinois protest, yes. How would work? Now I, well, I went to two of them. There was one two weeks ago. Man, they had like 500 or more people. The first one was a lot of Trump people. Mm -hmm. which, I mean, that's okay. Those are the ones behind us, right? MAGA people, right? Uh, yeah, but this one I didn't see very much that much Trump stuff. But it's just like we open, uh, they all be like 90% of the people there did not wear masks. They just like, this doesn't affect us because like we have white, we got white skin, so that keeps us immune. <laughs> but, uh, Exceptionalism. Yeah. Exceptionalism. <laughs> But I can see some legitimacy. I know some people who are small business people and they're really getting screwed. Yes, that's true and that's happening everywhere. That's yeah, because like a, something like Walmart, you know, they sell food so they can stay open, but they also sell shoes and clothes and electronics and everything else. So all these other small stores, like this friend of mine is a sh has a shoe store, everybody's gonna be going to Walgreens or using Amazon to order stuff. And all these people, I don't know what's gonna happen when they, whenever things open up, but uh, they're all, it's just benefiting these big corporations. That, that, that comment takes me to my second question, which is scarcity. Uh, uh, I really, I have the impression, because I chat from time to time with friends of mine in the US, and, and, and they don't say it directly, but while talking, they mentioned that they went to the grocery store and they didn't find this and they didn't find this and that. And I believe that that is, that, that is something that has not been well covered by the news. Am I wrong? I mean, because I hear about problems with uh, chicken, with uh, cow meat, with uh, forced toilet paper, with disinfectants and things like that. Uh, can you... Tell yeah, the di disinfectants, yeah. That is, I've never bought any, so I don't really know myself. I haven't gone in the stores and asked. You yourself with Lysol? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> about meat, I know that at this, what? A lot of these meat packing plants are, uh, they got, a lot of the workers there got coronavirus, so they had to shut them down. Like a big central place in Iowa. Yes, yes, I hear so that. Maybe, that, maybe that's one reason, that's the reason why there's a scarcity of meat. So, but, so, so you don't see it like a problem? No, it's not a problem, no, not, it's... A small problem. Okay, okay, okay. And that takes me to the, second, the third question, which is the economy. How do you think the U.S. economy will behave after this catastrophe? Because I see, it, especially in the U.S., that it is a catastrophe. Ah, uh, yes, they're starting to say now in, the, in like Wall Street Journal that this is not going to be some quick return to the way things were. And it's, I don't know when this is going to end, because if they open up, coronavirus is going to spread more. So then what are they going to do? And if they don't open up, well, it's going to spread more anyways, but not as fast. And since they're not really going to do anything to stop it, I really don't know what they're, they don't have a plan. It's just U.S. shows to the world that they just don't have a plan to deal with this. I saw in the 
Wall Street Journal uh, today, it said that retail sales last month were down 16 and a half percent compared to the month before. And 16 and a half percent down in April. And the industrial production index was down 11 percent. Oh, it's pretty sad. That's more than it was in China. Yes. So in terms of Trump's uh, competition with the China to see who's going to be number one, the consequence of the coronavirus in China and here is that China is coming out in a better position than the U.S. is yeah. going to. China is, China is already recuperating and their economy is already growing and the U.S. is just going down. And I don't, Trump doesn't really have a plan to get out of it. So you don't see a good, uh, a good uh, forecast in the U.S. economy, right? No, now there's what, 37 million unemployed because in the last two months, 37 million is more than in the Great Depression percent wise, I think. That's right, that's right. That's it, that's in addition to the unemployed before. And talking, now that you mentioned China, and, and we're talking about economy, uh, something that has been like worrying me a lot, not only me, a lot of us, actually you wrote a nice piece a few days ago that we post, published it in Orinoco Tribune about uh, how China has been, you know, exercising solidarity in the, in, in, in the midst of coronavirus. But uh, what I believe is going to happen with this anti-China narrative coming from the White House is that uh, the U.S. Uh, eventually is in the middle of this economic crisis that we're going to face in the, few, in the next weeks or months. Uh, they are going to end up uh, defaulting China's foreign debt. And uh, that's going to be bad for the U.S., but I, I, I'm not sure how bad that's going to be for the Chinese. I believe that the Chinese are smart people and that they, they should be prepared for that. But, and, and what you are talking right, mentioning right now about, the, about the, the, the industrial apparatus of China being more prepared than the U.S. made me believe that uh, disregarding that financial crisis or exchange rate crisis that might come soon, uh, China will be more prepared. How do you see it? Do I think that, do I see about the U.S. is going to default? Uh, no, no, no. I mean, if they did that to China, that'd make everybody else in the world pretty nervous to have money in U.S. bonds. Yes, of course, but they have been talking about that a lot, right? Yes, but I think eighty percent of world trade takes place in U.S. dollars, and if the U.S. loses that. That's the end of the U.S. Yes, I saw about and, and, and to start defaulting on your debts to other countries, like, then why would you want to keep dollars? So, or why would you get U.S. debt? Yes. But I, I'm not, I don't know enough about that, but that's my, I have a feeling the U.S. is not going to do that. They have no reason to do it. China's not asking for their money now, so the interest rate is very low, so what? What's why would they bother to default okay. as to read what the u.s recovering uh, the u.s was going into an economic recession anyways yes. i think trump was trying to um make sure it didn't happen before the election but now it's happened before the election yes. so and um, this just made the recession a lot worse and a lot more sudden it makes sense so Huh? Now my last question. Uh, how do you see social movements, if there are any <laughs> at this point in the U.S., uh, reacting to the crisis in order to change the system in the U.S.? Well, there are not very many public protests now, unfortunately. Yes, of 
the two biggest ones I know are the biggest ones I know are these reopen protests, which at least shows that you can go out and protest because it's important that people see that you can go out and protest. I mean, they could, they could, the government could have said, well, we have social distancing and shelter in place guidelines. You cannot go protest. We don't allow it, but they, they didn't interrupt those protests. But I haven't seen a lot of, uh, the only kind of protests I've seen in Chicago, they've had a lot around getting uh, these prisoner, people in prison held on bail. They can't pay their bail to get them out of prison. And they've had car care vans. And I think that- Up in the rent, right? Yeah, the rent protests, I'm not, I don't know if there have been any outside or what they've been doing. I know the Chicago Cuba Coalition had a protest against the attack on the Cuba embassy that was outside downtown. I know there have been some places in the country that had protests against the um, uh, sending uh, warships to Venezuela, US warships to Venezuela last month. I didn't hear so, that one. Uh, there was one in Western Massachusetts. Okay, okay. Um, but there are not, have not been very many protests. I mean, there, we can have protests. Yes. Of, co of course, the problem, like the thing today, if it wasn't for the news media, there's nobody downtown anyways. So <laughs> you can have a protest and there's nobody to see it because- I mean, uh, the, the things that has been happening lately a lot in terms of protests has been those car protests, car caravans and things like that. I the only option at this moment, but I don't know. So, so there's no, there's no hope. <laughs> I know that already before coronavirus, the situation was very tough for progressive people in the U.S. After the withdrawal of uh, their hope, uh, the hope of many in the progressive movement. Uh, this guy, Sanders. Yes. So, 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 but I believe that right now maybe the situation is worse according to what you say or not. I think people now are waiting to see what's going to happen with the coronavirus. Okay. If, if it's going to, they'll end this so called shelter in place by the end of May, then okay, they'll wait till the end of May. But if it just goes on indefinitely, I'd, I'd, I'd be interested to see what's going to happen. So do you see this is just like a timeout? Yeah, so I don't know what's going to happen in summer. When you have all the parks and everything, are people not going to go out yes. in public? That's going to, and how you, what the police going to start beating up uh, the white people like they I guess they do with a lot of blacks and Latinos in New York. Exactly. No, they're not. They're not going to do that. So once they see people going out into the parks and say, yeah, okay, we can go out and protest. So it's okay. But now I guess people are still waiting to see like who's going to go out first and what's going to happen. It's gonna be cool. I mean, not not in terms of police, but in just as it for their personal health safety, is it a good mm -hmm. idea or not? Yes, of course. Okay, and I, that's it for I, me. I wanted to ask you about um, how Venezuelans see the U.S. now with the total incompetence of the government in the coronavirus, handling the coronavirus where they Yes. I mean, it's, it's, uh, you, years ago, the U.S. used to be the world leader in, in solving uh, these epidemic problems around the world and coming up with solutions. And now they're just like, yes. they, it they, seems to me they're like they're a laughing stock. And I don't know yes, what. Yes, yes, that's my impression, too. That's my impression, too. Oh, the Venezuelans there. And yeah. They, that, that, that's impression uh, in many countries. I believe, of course, we here in Venezuela are might be biased because we are in a, like a long-standing confrontation with the U.S. Uh, uh, and of course, the Chavista. If you ask a Chavista like me, uh, I see 
see it exactly the way you see it. I mean, the U.S. seems to me to be a life, uh, like a lost stock. Uh, it's not a, a leader in anything. In the contrary, it's instead of bringing uh, leadership and calm and solidarity and help, assistance or whatever, it's just bringing sporting war, sporting coronavirus, uh, uh, sporting fear, and sporting confrontation between uh, among countries. So wh whatever the U.S. means for, uh, at least for me, and I believe that for many Venezuelans, uh, I mean that here I'm not talking just uh, for Chavistas alone. I, I, I have contact, I have relatives that are anti-Chavistas, and I believe that they see it the step, very similar to the way I see it, disregarding that they might be praying for Trump to invade Venezuela, because they are right-wingers. But uh, uh, in terms of the dealing uh, with the pandemic, uh, everyone, at least here in Venezuela, Chavistas and anti-Chavistas uh, see it the way you are seeing it. And I believe that that's happening everywhere. So that must have some impact on the anti-Chavistas who look to the U.S. as for leadership and overthrowing or removing the government somehow. Have they like thought that, well, we cannot look in that direction anymore because these people are incompetent as they showing the coronavirus and as they show with supporting Guaido all the time who never gets anywhere, who just everything he does just turns into a, makes them look more and more like a fool. Yes. So we, we should stop trying to follow the orders of the U.S. because that's not going to get us anywhere. So that, I mean, the opposition, I know the Guaido's party is going to stay doing what he wants. Well, he's not in that party anymore. I don't know what, like, the moderately opposition parties, are they, have they changed their orientation at all away from the U.S. more or kind of become questioning about how good it is to rely on the U.S.? It is complicated. Those guys are very hard to understand. It's like your MAGA guys up there. It's hard to get into their heads. <laughs> anyway, uh, I believe that there are, are squalidos here, as we call them, uh, uh, have taken part of what you say in their analysis. I mean, what you say in terms of, wow, this country, the U.S., is not like the, you know, the, the, the best scene on earth as we see it like one year ago. So that might have an impact in, in, in their decision, but they somehow managed to dissect the reality. <laughs> and and it, I believe that they still, uh, some of them uh, still support the crazy Guaido mercenary regime change operation that is, everyone knows that is a US regime change operation. So, uh, so at the end of the day, there's a lot of also uh, mass media and social media bombarding of anti-Chavista information while everything is happening, trying to keep those guys still uh, disconnected from reality. You know what I'm trying to tell you? So I believe that the, most of them, I believe that they have, in, in, overall, they have loose a lot of support and you can translate that while seeing that uh, parties like Primero Justicia which is one of the most important parties that that support Guaido uh, and one of the most ideologically aligned with the ideas of Guaido uh, is trying to set uh, aside from Guaido. Actually, yesterday we posted a, a piece on that because uh, uh, there was a piece that was posted uh, by, by Bloomberg, uh, not naming the source, but talking about a Chavista leader, anti-Chavista leader, I mean, 
saying that they uh, that that Guaido is losing support. And then later yesterday, uh, some uh, anti-Chavista journalists pointed at uh, Caprile Radonsky, like the one uh, uh, that was sneaking that information to Bloomberg. So, so that's saying that that somehow says that there's gonna be a split. Uh, uh, within the, the what, what we call in Venezuela G4, I mean, uh, those the four parties that form the alliance that keeps the majority in the national, majority in the quotations in the National Assembly. I'm talking about Primero Justicia, Voluntad Popular, Un Nuevo Tiempo, and Acción Democrática. Those are the, the parties that, that, that are part of G4 which is the core, political core of Guaido. If that seems get divided, uh, Guaido is going to be in trouble because he already faced a division uh, early this year with all the craziness uh, electing the, the new, you know, chair of the National Assembly. So, so it's not going to be easy for Guaido to do that. And that's why a lot of people uh, have been talking uh, lately in Venezuela that uh, maybe the anti-Chavismo right now might be looking for a new uh, a replacement for Guaido because I cannot talk about leaders because that guy is not a leader of anything. <laughs> so uh -huh. but they, they might be looking for a replacement uh, for Guaido and, uh, and I believe that eventually it's going to happen. That, but of course, that is not necessarily connected with the craziness of the way uh, in the way the gringos have been dealing with the pandemic, with the coronavirus, but somehow that affects also people's mind. And you might be right trying to connect those two things. Well, it must have an impact on people when they see that the U.S. Uh, government is incompetent to solve this problem here, how much competence are they going to show towards overthrowing the government in Venezuela, which they're, I guess, equally incompetent in overthrowing the government in Venezuela as they are yeah. stopping coronavirus. That's true, that's true. And also, and also it's, I mean, all the, more than what, like, like, we're talking about 15 months of the U.S. hardcore attacks on Venezuela, like, never before. And saying that that we are like just a few days to see a change and nothing happened, and that's also a defeat for the U.S. That also says a lot about how ineffective the U.S. government, the U.S. regime, U.S. imperialism is. So that's another good point that that adds to the already messy uh, managing of the pandemic in the U.S. Hmm. All right. No more questions? No, those are just those questions I had about that. Just. Uh, Do you want to add something else before we cut it off? I can't think of anything offhand. I just say that what I think um, this pandemic in the United States shows is that to try to explain what the government is doing, I think they're motivated by how do we solve this problem without showing that public health and the national health insurance is a good idea. A and I think that's, I think that's their number one thing that's like, we don't want to do anything that's going to give people the impression that that's a good idea. Because that's, we're 100% we're neoliberal and that is definitely not everything and the opposite of neoliberalism. We're not going to go there. So 100,000 people die, okay, it's a deal. We'll do, we'll go for it, which probably be 100,000 by next weekend. Yes, yes, that's true. And, and, and when you say it at the beginning of the interview, I was like, wow, I never saw it that way. And that make a lot of sense. Uh, disregarding that, there are all other theories of, uh, for example, I read something, after, I, we posted something in Orinoco Tribune a few weeks ago, a few days ago, uh, uh, when the, where the writer talked about uh, 
that strong when he realized that who, who were the ones dying from COVID, he decided not to do anything. That's another explanation, but your explanation makes a lot of sense too. But we know that the guys are racist, and, and when he started looking at the numbers at the beginning of the pandemic, realizing that most of the deaths were coming from Latinos and Black, he might be amazed uh, with those numbers, and maybe he decided, okay, maybe this is going to work for us. Let's let those Latinos um, make bad Mexicans uh, rapers to die. And that's what I well, said. that could be, but yeah, but it's mostly old people who die, and you know? a lot of old people, old white people, are Trump voters. So yes, 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 it's crazy. But and it's, they, they, they probably vote. A lot of blacks and Latinos don't. But it's true that pointing at the healthcare system make a lot of things true. That's true. So thank you, Stan, again for accepting our invitation. Uh, we're gonna post. We're gonna make a piece on it and post it on Orinoco Tribune. Uh, I'm gonna try to do it in the next 48 hours, and uh, and we hope to see you soon. And keep your okay. Well, thank you. Important. Thanks for having me on. Bye, -bye <laughs> my friend. Take care and be safe. Bye. Home. <laughs> Bye. Bye.